Derek Pitts has been associated with the Franklin Institute Science Museum since 1970, designing and presenting New York Museum's public programs and exhibits. Pitts was the original director of the Tome and Omnax Theater, Museum Vice President, and many other value positions. He has been Chief Astronomer and Director of the Fells Planetarium since 1990, having written and produced more than two dozen planetarium programs. He serves as the U.S. National Spokesperson for IA Group, International uh, Year of Astronomy 2009, and currently is a NASA Solar System Ambassador, NASA's first astrobiology uh, NASA. He has written numerous astronomy columns for newspapers and national magazines. He appears regularly on all the major television networks as a science content expert, and for more than two decades has hosted award-winning astronomy radio programs for Philadelphia's WHYY 91 FM and WXPN's Kids Corner radio programs. Pitts is an on-air content contributor for national and international television networks. He's had stunning appearances on the Comedy Central's Colbert Report and the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson on CBS. And also met President Barack Obama and his family when he was invited to the White House to participate in the first ever White House Star Wars. Pitts is nationally known as an excellent teacher. His presentations are stimulating, humorous, intellectually challenging, and compelling, and at the same time accessible to the broadest audiences. He puts his emphasis on making sure that everyone can come to the future of the universe as he sees it. Not a watered-down sketch of the universe, but a rich, deep, complex version with human connections that everyone can understand somehow. <laughs> Among his many awards are the Mayor's Liberty Bell, the St. Lawrence University Distinguished Alumni Award, the GW Carver Medal, Please Touch Museum's Great Friend and Kids Award, Induction into the Germantown Historical Society Hall of Fame, Spectrum Magazine in 2004, uh, the 2010 inaugural recipient of the David Rittenhouse Award, an honorary Doctor of Science degree from LaSalle University uh, in 2011, and just last year was named Wagner Free Institute's first fellow and awarded the honorary degree Doctor of Human Letters. Pitts currently serves as the Science Museum Planetarium Urban Outreach Advisor for the world's largest research telescope at Monarchy Observatories in Hawaii. He also serves as Academic Affairs Committee Chair on the Board of Trustees for his alma mater, St. Lawrence University, and uh, as the immediate past president of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of Tuskegee Airmen and Boulders. With a warm round of applause, please join me in welcoming back to the Supreme Court. This morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I graduated from Germantown Academy um, about the year before rocks were invented. And uh, the year I graduated, well, a couple of years later after that, fire came into existence and uh, the universe was born and things like that. So back in 1973, when I graduated from Germantown Academy, all this stuff that we see here wasn't here. But it was a great school. I had a great time here. And, uh, you know, as is obvious, it was a great preparation for everything else I was going to do in my life. So uh, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what I do. Let me give you a couple of quick updates, first of all, uh, on my CV. Uh, excuse me, let's see. Um, uh, 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 uh. Oh yeah, right, so uh, the White House Star Party, yeah, the White House Star Party in 2009. That was the first time a sitting president ever had a star party on the White House lawn. And a small group of astronomy people were invited to come, help to service about 300 middle school kids from around the D.C. area, because the president was very much interested in putting forth you know, the idea and helping people understand how critical STEM education is. So I was invited to this. And I was invited because here we are in Center City, Washington, D.C., the sky is full of light. What can you see with a telescope? What can you find with a telescope? Well, you can just about see the moon. So since we wanted to see much more than that, it was necessary to have somebody who's really good with a telescope in an urban environment. And that's me. I'm just about the best you can find in the US for somebody who can find stuff in an urban sky full of light with a telescope. So that was pretty cool. I get to meet the president and his family. Man, fabulous, just amazing. I wish I had a picture. Why don't I have a picture? It's astronomy. We're outside in the dark. You can't see anything. You don't want to flash people's eyes with a bright flash, so no pictures. What can I say? 
But I was invited to come back and do that again this past fall. And as it turns out, this is the second White House star party out on the South Lawn, and I'm one of only two people in the whole group to come back for a second time, the only guy in informal science education operating a telescope. So I have this really cool distinction. It's cool because I don't think there's ever going to be another White House star party, and I'm pleased to have been able to attend both of them. So that's pretty cool. If only I could have worn a Germantown Academy sweatshirt, that would have been perfect. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, so, first of all, I love science. I absolutely love science. There's nothing about science I don't love. I love everything about it. I love the discovery, I love the curiosity, I love the complexity, I love the challenges, I love everything there is about science. It really excites me. It's always been exciting in my life. And so everything I do is always related to science. The way I view the world is totally connected to science and mathematics. When I look around any place, I'm not really thinking so much about what I'm going to say or what I'm doing as much as I'm taking in how everything is put together by the physics of the universe. Why is it that the molecules and the atoms in this room are all held together the way they are to create the different materials that we see? Why is that? What are the principles that govern all that stuff? And how is it that they don't change somehow in some piece of fraction of time and suddenly becomes something else. I'm fascinated by the rules and the principles and the laws and just the physical parameters themselves of the universe that make it what it is. Now part of the reason why I'm really jazzed about that is because I read a book a few years ago by Martin Rees. Martin Rees is the Astronomer Royal of the UK and Martin Rees is Stephen Hawking's running buddy. So when Stephen Hawking has an idea about Stephen Hawking has an idea about something, and he needs somebody to bounce the ideas off of to find out whether he's on the right track, talks to Martin Rees. So I met Martin when he was here in Philadelphia a number of years ago at some other program related to Franklin Institute. We don't have to talk about now. And Martin gave me a copy of his book called Just Six Numbers. Just Six Numbers. It's a small book, 150 pages, easy reading to a degree, because it's about physics. It's about deep physics. And the deep physics it's about is, there are six parameters of physics that make the universe manifest itself as we see it right now. If you were to change any one of those numbers by a thousandth a ten thousandth of a percent, the universe is completely different. Totally different. That just blows my mind. If you change any one of those parameters by just the tiniest amount, the universe doesn't exist the way it is. So for the universe to be this way, all six of those numbers have to be exactly correct. Otherwise, we have a totally different universe. Why would that be? So these are the things that fascinate me about the universe. These are the things that I'm thinking about whenever I'm out and about doing anything else, because I'm thinking about that stuff. That's what's running in the back of my mind. This fabric of the universe and how it all works. The word that you might be most familiar with about this stuff is the matrix. I'm interested in the matrix and how the matrix works. Now, superimposed on top of all that stuff is my foremost love and appreciation in science, and that is space exploration, astronomy and space exploration. So what I brought you here is a combination of some of that stuff. It's one of my favorite characters in science, Benjamin Franklin, it better be because I work at the guy's place. <laughs> and it's also space exploration and astronomy, and they all kind of fit together. So let me run through this because I want to make sure I have time left over for you to ask questions. So I'm going to go pretty quickly, okay? All right, here we go. Benjamin Franklin, the astronomy of the frontiers of space exploration. Okay, so when people wonder about Benjamin Franklin and space exploration and things like that, Ben Franklin did not fly on the space shuttle, okay? 
He didn't walk on the moon, didn't do any of that stuff. In fact, Franklin was hardly connected to astronomy at all. People always ask, did he do anything in astronomy? Not really. What he did was connected as a conduit for others that were interested in astronomy back to the Royal Society in London and things like that. But he never really did any astronomical observing on his own, wasn't really interested. Meteorology, electricity, a few other things he was really interested in, and did really well with one of them. And you can see it right here. It's the lightning thing. Franklin, of course, is famous because he's the guy that figured out how lightning works, and that's pretty important. He started out, though, as this really curious character. You all know this story. He was a printer, came to Philadelphia from Boston when he was very young, got a job working in his brother's print shop, and realized from that point that he could do something else other than just be a regular, run-of-the-mill printer's apprentice. He realized that he could take advantage of his opportunity, and he could not only become a printer, but he could become a writer, and because he was associated with publishing, he could become an entrepreneur. And he used that entrepreneurial sense to build a fortune for himself. He amassed a fortune. He was independently wealthy by the time he was in his early 40s. He started that way as a printer. But because he could use his entrepreneurial skills to build up so much business for himself in the publishing business, he could act as an independently wealthy person in the colonies at that time. So he was a postmaster, he was a publisher, he was all an inventor of all these other different things. And of course, you know, his major claim to fame is that he's the guy who managed to figure out what lightning was. We now know that lightning is nothing more than gigantic static electricity, and Franklin was the first person to use a lot of the words that we commonly associate with direct current these days. Positive, negative, battery, all sorts of things like that. Franklin came up with those terms. Franklin was a fun guy. He's the guy you want to invite to a party because he loves to do fun things and play tricks on people with his knowledge about static electricity. I don't know if you know it or not, but yes, it's true. Franklin used to try to use electricity to shock turkeys. He used to use an electricity, a static electricity generator to shock his friends at parties. In fact, he took a shock so intense once that he knocked himself out and people thought he was dead. He thought it was a great party trick. So he tended to do this more than once and would do it to friends of his. He's a real great guy. A real sense of humor. So his claim to fame is being able to understand it. Now not only did he understand it, but he understood it to the point where he figured out how to control it. Every building in the world has one of these things. Doesn't look very inspiring, does it? No, it's an old piece of bent metal. It's probably one of the most important pieces of bent metal in the world today. It's a piece of one of Franklin's original lightning rods. What Franklin did was he put these things on top of a building. Well, uh, straightened out, of course. He put them out up on top of buildings, and what would happen is these would attract lightning to the metal piece. He figured out that if I run this metal piece right to the ground, the electricity would catch this first, make the shortest trip to ground where it could neutralize itself, and it wouldn't affect the building at all. A radical change in insurance at that point in the, 19, in the 1750s. Why? Because buildings were burning down from lightning strikes all the time. Franklin has figured out how do we save the buildings? How do we protect them? So now every tall building in the world, every one of them, has this system. If Franklin had patented this, his family would be the richest family on the planet with no question whatsoever because you cannot build a building without one of these. It's a tremendous invention. But Franklin thought that this should be for the people, so he took credit but didn't take any money for it. So we know that lightning is pervasive everywhere. And Franklin is the guy who's known for controlling lightning. The way in which it's said in some places is that he wrested power from the gods by being able to redirect lightning. It made him a rock star without compare. It was famous everywhere, everywhere. So, cool. Here's a really interesting image. I don't know if you know where this is or not. Who knows where the lightning capital of the country is? What state has more lightning than any other state? 
Florida. Right. This is a photograph of lightning in Florida. Down in the lower left hand corner over here. Can you see that little thing right there? Any idea what that is? It's a space shuttle launch stack. Space shuttle launch stack is the launch pad for the space shuttle. So it's right over there, bathed in floodlight, where they're planning to launch in the next couple of days, but there's a lightning storm right here. And here you can see a lightning strike on top of the launch stack. So it's a rainy day, you can see the lightning coming down, and it seems to strike the top of the gantry here. Space shuttle's there, you just can't see it. The reason why it's safe is because of that thing. That's a fiberglass version of Franklin's invention. And that's on every launch tower you see anywhere now to protect spacecraft against lightning strikes. So here you can see a field of them around this SpaceX launch vehicle. And here's what that launch, uh, that uh, lightning tower looks like when it was taken off of the space shuttle gantry when the space shuttle program ended. It's enormous, it did the job very well, and so even Benjamin Franklin is directly connected to space exploration because without his lightning rod, we wouldn't be able to do space exploration as we know it today. Gotta have it. Delicate electronics and all those spacecraft, you can't have that stuff fried in, right? Okay, so Benjamin Franklin, the search of a better world, he was a great guy. So, now, let's talk about the space stuff. So the world of space exploration is changing dramatically. Franklin was the kind of a guy who would love this because he loved progress. He loved seeing progress. And in the space program today, there's a tremendous amount of progress that many people don't know about. This is what the future of space exploration was looking like back in the 1950s. These really cool wheel-shaped space stations, spacecraft with fins and things like that. Why do you need fins in space? Is there any real need for fins in space? No, there's no need for fins in space. And then I don't even know what these things are over here, but it's fantasy. So, you know, what can you say about that? So, the, the, here we see one of the most powerful launch vehicles ever, anywhere. The Saturn V launch vehicle uh, is the booster rocket responsible for sending astronauts to, to the moon back in the late 60s and 70s. And uh, this was the most complex device ever built at that time. The most complex. And it's really stunning when you think about the details of what this thing had to do and how it did it. If you have any interest at all, take a look at it online and you'll be stunned at the technology that made this thing work. At the same time, this was an amazing spacecraft also because it could take off like a rocket and land like an aircraft. It was basically like a space pickup truck. That was the job that space shuttle was supposed to do. Carry stuff up to orbit so that this could be built. And it accomplished the task very, very well. The International Space Station is about the size of a football field. And on board right now, I think I can remember if there's six astronauts on board the International Space Station right now. It's pretty cool. 220 miles up, moving along at 17,000 miles per hour. You know that people have been living and working in space consistently every day for the last 18 years. So for all of your lives, pretty much, people have lived and worked in space. Not remarkable to you. I get it, because it's always been part of your lives. For the rest of us dinosaurs, that's <laughs> amazing. Really, are you serious, people up there? Here's the other amazing thing about Space Station. It flies over Philadelphia between four and seven times every day. Space Station flies over Philadelphia no less than four times, no more than seven times every day. And you can see it. It's nice and bright. If you go out at the right time, you can spot it either in the pre-dawn sky before sunrise or in the evening sky after sunset. And life on board Space Station is amazingly interesting. Yeah, sure, it's got its drawbacks. You can't open the window. You can't go out for a walk. But think of it this way. There's no rain. It's never really cold. And maybe your food is not the best food in the world, but it's the most exciting view you can imagine. Looking at the Earth from Earth orbit is just stunning. It really gives you a very good perspective on the fragility of this planet. And it also gives you an incredible perspective on the unity that this planet should have. 
You know the story. When you look down at the surface of the planet, you don't see boundaries between countries. You don't see ethnicities. You see land masses surrounded by water, all covered by an incredibly thin atmosphere, which at any one time, if it were breached, all life on the planet would die. Die. Did I say die? I meant die. <laughs> So if you have any questions about CO2 footprints and the need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere, take a look at that thin line right there. That's the difference between life on this planet and absolutely 100% certain death. It's a nasty environment out there. It is nasty. No air, no air pressure, no heat. The worst radiation you could imagine. You don't want to be out there. It's not nice. <laughs> so we've got to do everything we can to protect the planet we live on. All right, let's go for it. All right, so here we are now. We're out on Mars, taking a look around the surface with this really great device, the Curiosity rover, has told us a tremendous amount about Mars. We now know for sure, there's no question about it, that at one time in the history of this planet, there was a lot of water out there. A lot of water out there. But this is the reason why we're there. Make no mistake about it. We're not there to find out if there's water there or not. We want to find out if there's any cereal there. Because if there's cereal, that means there must be some people or some creatures that are eating it, and that's what we really want to find out. We want to find out about life elsewhere. But what's the next step? What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? Well, you've heard the stories. We should do something about the American space program, and then we should, uh, let's, uh, like, let's go to Mars. Yeah, great idea. Except for one thing. We have to build up some kind of infrastructure for that to happen, and that's incredibly important. But building infrastructure is expensive. It's really expensive, especially for this. And the reason why it's especially expensive for this is because, like I said, you're going to die. So you have to make sure that all of your systems work perfectly. They must work perfectly. Or else, you're going to die. <laughs> right. Think about it. You get in your car on Sunday, this past Sunday. You're going to drive to the movies, like Carol's going to go to the movies. Movie theaters are closed. Your car gets stuck. You pull over to the side of the road. You call somebody. A tow truck comes. They pull you out of the snow. You drive on. Let's say you get in a spacecraft like Space Shuttle. You light the engines. You blast up to 17,000 miles per hour. You're up uh, 200 miles up outside the Earth's atmosphere. And suddenly the engine quits. Who are you going to call? <laughs> no, not Ghostbusters. <laughs> Call anybody. What happens if uh, something goes wrong with your engine? You pull over to the side of the road. If you're handy, you get out of the car, you lift the hood, you go underneath, you figure out what it is, you fix it, you close the hood, and you take off again. That's not happening in space. The machines are too complicated, the environment's too nasty. Your thing has to work. No questions asked. So, what do you do? You do something that we do not find in American manufacturing at all. You find redundancy. You know what redundancy means. Instead of having one system, you have a backup system. If the primary system fails, you got a backup. Cool. Right? You don't need that in, American, in the American economy. Why? Because we want you to buy more. Imagine if your washing machine had redundancy. You wouldn't have to buy another washing machine for another 10 or 20 years. But that's not the way the American economy wants. We need you to buy a washing machine every 10 years, so we want it to fail. But in this case, in space exploration terms, you need not redundancy, not double, you need triple redundancy. Everything has to be done three times and four times deep. Otherwise, very good, you die. Good, okay. So it's expensive though. It costs money to do this. So if NASA needs money, how does NASA get the money it needs to do what it needs to do? It could advertise. Yeah, that's not really the way to go about that. That causes problems. 
you know, you turn it into a giant Pizza Hut delivery truck, and that's not really space exploration, so to speak. So the government has to pay for it, and that's expensive. But not really. Do you know NASA's budget is about 17, no, it's 18 billion dollars this year. 18 billion dollars. 18 billion. Bill Gates carries that when he goes to lunch. <laughs> Where does that stand in the United States budget line item wise? $18 billion is about 14th in the top 20 line items of the United States budget. What are we doing for that money? We've got tons of satellites launched by NASA. We've got research vehicles exploring the sun. We just sent a spacecraft that visited the planet Pluto and sent us back gorgeous images. We have space probes orbiting every planet in the solar system. We have space telescopes. We have all this stuff. Not to mention all the aviation stuff NASA does. All the invention, creation, discovery, technology for $18 billion. Imagine what it could do with 25. Wow. Bill Gates could give that up and we wouldn't even, even miss it. Please understand me. I'm going to say something controversial. Do not take this the right, the wrong way. <laughs> the United States Defense Department budget is more than $550 billion a year. $550 billion per year. NASA's budget is 18. I'm just saying. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay, so, here's another way you can do it. Mr. Electric Car Tesla here has money burning a hole in his pocket because he and his cronies invented PayPal and then they sold it. So he made a huge amount of money and he's doing something that he's always wanted to do. He's following his own dream of building a spacecraft company that launches vehicles. He's doing a great job. You can see it in the news. It's fantastic. He's doing it with his own money. But he's doing it because he's generating the business of taking satellites into Earth orbit, providing access to low Earth orbit for a cost. He has a contract with NASA now to provide 12 launches to resupply the International Space Station. He's going to make money on this, but he's opening a door in the commercial development of space. And that is really changing things a lot. Everybody thinks that NASA's not doing anything anymore. NASA's doing a lot, but what it's actually doing is it's outsourcing the easy stuff. The easy stuff. Taking toilet tissue and pizzas and vodka to International Space Station. You don't need NASA services for that. You get somebody else to do that. You get the delivery guy to do that. That's what SpaceX is doing. But it's also going to take astronauts, too, and that's going to change the way in which we think about space exploration. Now, Richard Branson is coming at it from another direction. He's going to make it possible for every one of us, for a reasonable price, to be able to go visit space. Now, what's reasonable? Well, if I told you the price, you'd say, that doesn't sound reasonable at all. How bad is it? 250 k 250000 buys you a trip on his spacecraft to go up to space for the afternoon. As a visitor, right? That's not really working yet. But it will soon. Like this year, I expect there might be some real flights. He's done some tests, there have been some problems. You know, it's not easy. But 250k is a good price. Why? Because the Russians, not too long ago, would take an International Space Station for 10 days for 22 million. So 250,000 is not bad, right? It's getting better. So as things go further forward, Richard Branson's system will buy that cost down and we'll be able to do it for maybe 20,000 in 10 years. That won't be bad. It's a little dicey right now. It's not exactly safe. Hope your insurance is good. <coughs> but in any case, this is the horizon that's coming in space exploration. This is what's happening. The door is opening to commercial enterprises, not uh, international or national agencies. Oh, the national agencies are still there, but what they need to do is they need to do the big stuff. The big, deep space exploration. That's what they should be doing. And guess what? That's what NASA's doing. If you get some story from somebody somewhere that NASA isn't doing very much, those people don't know what they're talking about. NASA's outsourced the easy stuff. It's doing the hard stuff. The stuff that takes a lot of money to do. And they do it pretty well. Do a very good job of it. Yeah, there's some accidents. Space exploration is hard. 
When you go out there, the environment is nasty. When things go wrong, what happens? You die. You die. But think back about exploration 400, 500, 1,000 years ago across the planet. What was that like? Exactly like this. What's the analog for commercial space exploration these days? The beginning of commercial aviation. Started out after the Wright brothers first developed the powered craft. It started out as the US government asking for mail service provided by aircraft. SpaceX, taking food and supplies up to the International Space Station. Same thing. Okay, so it's happening. All right, let's go. On. We have a spaceport here in the United States, maybe a couple of spaceports here in the US. And, like Franklin, Musk and Branson are self made men working the cutting edge of technology today. We have to roll on. But what does it mean for us? Well, deep discoveries. We can use these telescopes like Hubble Space Telescopes. There are these other big telescopes around the planet that are doing deep space work, trying to figure out how the universe got started, what the fate of the universe is going to be, and what all is out there. This is the instrument I'm working on right now. 30 meter telescope. It will be the biggest telescope on the planet when it opens in the early 2020s. I'm so glad to be part of that. And I'll tell you why really quickly. When I was a kid, I wanted to be either an astronaut or an astronomer. I didn't know at that time which one it was going to be. I couldn't be an astronaut at that time because NASA wasn't hiring people that looked like me. And then there was no role model. So I couldn't pursue that career. But astronomy, that's academia. I can do that all right. But guess what? In that academia part of being an astronomer, what's the dream that, astronomer, that an astronomer would have? To be able to work on the biggest telescope on the planet. Nowadays, I can go out to Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Yeah, in Hawaii. I can go up to the mountain, knock on the door of any one of the observatories, and say, hey, can I come and hang around for the night? Uh, who are you? Oh, Eric Fitz, I work over at 30 meters. Oh, yeah, come on in. It's a dream come true. <laughs> Spend the night at the best observatory in the world, and then in the morning, go down and swim in the warm ocean off the coast of Hawaii. Okay, so it's big. Oh, by the way, got a little familiar? <laughs> I love it. This is 14,000 feet up, 60% of the oxygen in the atmosphere, and the temperature out here right now is about 35 degrees. It's gorgeous. That's what it's going to look like when it's done. But what are we really looking for? We're looking for planets elsewhere in the universe. And the reason why is because we suspected for a long time that there must be other planets. Kepler's satellite has used the transit method of examining stars to find out if there are any other planets out there. We found out, guess what? It seems like there's a planet orbiting every star of our galaxy. We did a survey of 150,000 stars, and so far the data shows that statistically it looks like every star should have a planet. How many stars is that in our galaxy? Like 300 billion. How many planets is that? Like 300 billion. But imagine that there are two planets for every star. How many planets are we now? 600 billion planets. So what are we looking for? We're looking for planets like ours. So out of 600 billion, what do you think the chances are that we could find a planet like ours? Pretty high. Crazy high. If it's more than 10, that's out of this world. That's out of your mind. 10 planets like Earth, and suppose five of them had an environment like this. And suppose of those five that had an environment like this, one of those places actually had some life on it. Wow. That would answer this question. This is what astronomers want to know. We don't care about how big the universe is. It doesn't matter. We don't care about how it really started. Well, maybe a little bit just to understand how it works. But we don't care about how it ends. Why? Because we ain't going to be here. <laughs> we don't need to know about galaxies everywhere else. Why? Because we're not going there. Because it's too big. The universe is enormous. <laughs> There's no word in any language I can think of that can adequately grasp the concept of the size of the universe. The scale. It's crazy. So we're not going there. But this is important. 
Why? Because it frames who we are. It tells us who we are. If we are alone here on this planet, by ourselves, in this vast galaxy of 300 billion stars, imagine what that's going to make us feel like if we look at the rest of the universe where there's another 50 billion galaxies and there's no other life. That means we're the pinnacle of the creation of the universe. Nobody else, nothing else thinks like we do. Planets don't have music. We have music. So what would that mean to us if we found some other life form out there somewhere else? Totally changes who we are and who we think we are. Completely redefines the universe. But with 600 billion planets in this galaxy alone multiplied by another 50 billion galaxies, the possibility is just coming out here for the possibility of life. So there's the framing for how you should think about who you are and where we are today in this universe. And I often like to get people to think about this. If we are the only life form and we are the pinnacle of the development of the universe that creates creatures like us, we are the top of everything. Why don't we behave more like that? It's an interesting question. Why do we act stupid? Why do we have wars? Why do we pick on each other? Why do we bully each other? Why don't we try to be the absolute best we can be? This thing up here is unparalleled throughout the entire universe. Nothing, hardly anything else, thinks. Hardly anything else, nothing thinks like we do. That makes us unique. Think about all your friends, though. They all have different minds, different thoughts. Each and every one of us, therefore, is also unique in the universe. Think about that. Okay, I've burned up some time. I want to take one question before we get out of here. So I'll say thank you very much. I'm done. Who's got a question?